Hi, so welcome. Today again is our conversation that matter. This is week two, episode two. So um, wow. So here we go. Hopefully today there's no technical issues, so we can have the whole sessions in one go. So I'm very excited about today's topic. So um, let's get started. And um, so first of all, when I was thinking about what to say for this week, um, I have a lot of topics written down. <laughs> And sometimes, usually, the last one that came on the list is the one that I feel most urged to talk about. And um, I think one of the reason is that um, recently, that I stumbled across some really interesting myths and uh, fairy tales. And once again, being reminded how powerful they are in terms of help us to understand our um, psyche, our unconscious mind. So, and that got back. Um, that got me to read some of the books that I, I, I love to read. I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell, so if some of you know that I talk a lot about archetypes, um, uh, the hero journey, and so forth. And I went back to one of his books, and it's called Pathway to Bliss. So, and and then when I was reading it, uh, and part of it was about symbols and mythology, of course, he's um, one of the most well-known mythologists. So when I talk about symbols, then um, that really embarked on a journey about me thinking about what Verita really captures my mind when I was growing up. And I already shared in Facebook before that for me it was um, The Little Mermaid. And, and I knew that, you know, whatever really captures your mind or fairy tale that really caused some sort of emotional stir in you, it's important to look into. So, of course, I look into Little Mermaid um, before and once again these days. And, of course, a different version. But I remember why I was so upset was, um, and I was crying a lot, probably with six, six and seven, and after watching the original uh, Anderson version where the mermaid became bubbles, um, I was crying a lot. I was really angry, and I actually told my mother I must speak to the writer, I must write to that person because that's just not right. And I think a, a, a lot in it um, was about not necessarily being righteous in, in, my, in, my, you know, in my world, but I think I have a very strong sense of um, what, it's, what is just and what is, it's, and it's, it's not. And, and I think I feel so compassionate to, towards Little Mermaid. And I think that can't be the reality. It, something better. It's, there and I, I like to create that and and I think even when I was little I was always very imaginative so for me I think I need to imagine a different ending for Little Mermaid so that's what really got into me and any any fairy tale that would be my number one and um, and find it so powerful is because there's always something in me that that um, is very strong as I said to the sense of right and wrong as well as creating a better future and so it kind of come across in my work as well and then so when I go back to reading some of the myths and also how to think about how how powerful these symbols are then I thought it's really important to share um, I think once in a while it's nice to just dive back into some of those legends and myths because I don't know about you but for me when I hear a story and when you hear the, the cause and effect or when you when you hear um, what the story the message of the story is about it really Gives you a hard moment. You you get it much um, stronger than you know. You, you you sometimes read a book or people tell you what's right to do. What's the, some of the wise words sounds great, but it just doesn't get it into your body. But when you hear a story, you hear it, and then sometimes that really just have a much stronger moral message. So, and this is what it is because you know the symbols, the messages, and myths. They they really help us to connect what is in the unconscious mind. Our unconscious is always seeking outward expression. So, whether it's um, through dreams or through when you re read a story that really got us really you know oh that's something very strong, stirs some emotion in us. They um, they they put us in touch with our unconscious because sometimes we just obviously. And conscious about it, and uh, and the thing, we, what really got me so interested in myths is that it doesn't matter um, how long ago this myth come about or where it is, the fact that they are they timeless because they they are the projected human experience, our human emotion. So our desire, our conflict, our wishes, our hope, and our fear, they're the same whether you're born a thousand years ago or last year. 
they are the same because it's our human nature and therefore you can hear you can you can read so many myths that this um from different country different culture they often have similar moral message and you find a lot in comparativeness you find a lot of um the first clear universal symbols say the resurrection about jesus um you know uh after death there is rebirth the resurrection there's also um, the same appear in Egypt with Isis and Osiris Smith, where he was also um, came from dead and rebirth, and there's um, resurrection. So those are symbols they from different countries, from different culture, different times, but uh, they have similar similar universal themes because, as I said, they are our projected experience, our projected emotions. So they all come from our unconscious mind, and those, that's what it tells the tale. And uh, another one, it's obviously the virgin births you can find in different culture. You know, you've got Mother Mary, uh, you've got Sun, God, Ra, and Net. There's many in Greek mythology as well that you can find virgin birth. So that's why I find it very interesting, no matter where it comes from, often it's the same moral message. Um, and we learn a lot from it if we are willing to. We learn a lot from our unconscious. We learn a lot about who we are, who we want to become, if we actually do the work and want to dive in. And um, that's why I find it so extraordinary. I love listening to myths when I was little, and actually even now I like to read different type of myths and just see, so what does it really mean? And, you know, before this um, conversation started, I did ask around what people's favorite myths are of fairy tale, and I will talk about them later on. But I do want to explain a little bit about myths and fairy tale and legends and all that. So for some people, myths are those, you know, uh, folklore. I mean, they are all kind of similar in a way. Many people see them as different type of folklore stories that passed down from generation to generation, whether it's the oral tradition or written form, they're all kind of, you know, stories that you heard. Um, and some people find myths usually have a more religious background association as such. I personally don't think necessarily that some myths that have, you know, no particular inclination to certain religion. And also you will find very similar myths in Asia, in Africa, um, as well in Egypt uh, and Greek culture. So for me, that that doesn't necessarily apply. Um, and fairy tales, obviously, it's a written form stories, and we don't get confused about that. We don't know, like, you know, the thing about myths is that sometimes people read it like historical events. And um, legends also another type of folklore where people would make, make, make base it on historical events. For example, King Arthur. So I read many books about it because I was so into that myths or legend. And it they have different message along the way with that. Um, King Arthur's story that, you know, because different characters, different archetypes in that story actually have something different to teach us. So whether it's the Lady of the Lake, whether it's King Arthur, whether it's the Bomogana or um, oh, uh, on the wizard, uh, Merin, I can't believe I nearly forgot, uh, one of my favorite. Um, they, I've done a lot of research on that, and so there's actually no necessarily um, clear record, historical sort of record to say whether King Arthur really exists um, as the King Arthur that we know. So, and you know, when we read myths or legends and fairy tales, it actually doesn't matter whether it's real, true historical ev um, events. And of course, a lot of the religions really bases on this type of myths, and they try to really find as any historical evidence to support it. But in my view, just personally, personally, I think what they really teach us is how to be a better self. What are the moral um, uh, principles, the spiritual principles that we can learn from, so therefore lead a better life, more meaningful life, or lead a, lead a life where we benefit others, most helpful, most kind. That's what I found interesting from MIPS. Um, you learn the lessons through them, and, and it's for me, it, I'm not too interested about discover whether it's all true, whether there's really a King Arthur figure in history. You know, some people go through links to find um, historical record, and that's historian's job. And for me, my interest is all about what do I learn from it. And of course, as you know, like Jesus is one of the biggest um, enlightened master, so, so to speak. And well, I mean, I do believe that he did walk on earth and whether everything that he had done, all the myths and legends that we had heard about, whether it actually happened, for me, it doesn't really matter. Whether resurrection was a um, historical event, it doesn't matter to me because the fact that is what it talks about, it's about the fact that, you know, that is never the, the end of life, it's a continuation of life because we believe in, you know, having a soul and spirit and so forth. Um, 
And for me, that's what it symbolizes. And in fact, resurrection happens in every culture, every myth that you look deep, deeply look into, you will find it. Um, so for me, that's all it matters is what we learn from it. So, wow, so that's the basis of how I read mythologies. And you know, today we got Athena with us. She's one of my favorite um, Greek goddess, and I love Greek goddess um, mythologies because, okay, so first of all, if you read some of the oldest um, mythology about goddesses, you will find that they are very much um, based on um, a society where it's matriarchy. So basically the empress, the women rule, and those mythologies are very different. The feminine power being used and organized are very different. And then when it comes to Greek mythology, actually we came into patriarchy society. So you get a lot of Greek goddesses um, that are under the, um, how can I put it? They, you hear lots of Greek goddess, goddesses um, myths where the women were not in a position to rule they would be sabotaged or suppressed in many cases you know greek goddesses were raped or kidnapped or took advantage of so they were at, at that time where the greek mythology came um come about that's already in a patriarchy society the, the way it was written you can tell is from a patriarchy point of view and but if you read some of the oldest um mythology that about goddesses um, perhaps from, from um, Near East, um, in the East, also that, that you will hear more um, where they are coming from patriarchy, matriarchy point of view. So anyway, we're not going to dive into it <laughs> today because I have a lot to talk about and and as I said, really, it's not where they come from. Sometimes it's that what they teach us. So, and the way mythology works, the magic is through the symbols. And the symbol is like the automatic button. Once they appear in your consciousness, where you read it, you see it as an icon or whatever way it triggers, it's like the symbol trigger that button where you release the energy and channels the energy where it's in your unconscious. So I don't know what symbols for you that really rings the bell, but sometimes you can think about dreams. Dreams, sometimes we get symbols, whether it's rose, sometimes uh, roses like flowers, or um, a sense of a never ending stairs, or walking in a tunnel, walking in a forest, or different circumstances or things that you see. Those are symbols that reflect what's going on in your, in your conscious mind. And is this is the way how unconscious might talk to us? I know that today we're actually touching a lot of different subjects. I'm trying to become growing as as, as much as I can, but I have to say sometimes I do digress. So, <laughs> but um, uh, and then now it's, it's really important that, to think about what kind of symbols really um leave a strong impression for you that comes up in your dream or really triggers some of your emotions. So um, okay, so something to to think about maybe it pops up during our conversation, and um and you know. The thing is that I, when I was writing down a list of topics I want to include in this conversation that matters, I wanted to talk about something maybe a little bit more um, universal that applied to people coaching their life and things that people really can associate. And I wasn't really thinking about going into myths or archetype um, so so early, perhaps, or like you know right away. But I felt very like a strong pull to talk about it. And then I thought about look, hold on a minute, like actually be able to get in touch with our unconscious, really help us a lot about understanding why we do certain things, behave in a way, our behavioral pattern. When, it, when you get to know yourself better, that really helps how to navigate and lead your life, isn't it? So, you know, it may come from a different perspective or an angle that may be different from some other coaching, but I think, you know, it may be worth to bring the topic to our conversation that matters series. So that's why I do it. And um, and I hope it matters to you. Just think about what kind of theme or symbol, uh, uh, symbols, dreams that really triggers you. And it may tell you something you didn't know before. So anyway, um, where am I? Like, I do have um, some notes maybe because I want to make sure I cover things I want to talk about. Um, so for me, what do I learn from it? So apart from just hearing a fantastic story, you know, I, I, as I said before, I love the, um, um, the Mist of Avalon, I love the books, um, I love all the myths and legends around that subject. I've been to Glastonbury myself, um, absolutely love it. And I love it not just because the, um, the mythology itself, but the whole, the whole story, that there's so much 
to learn to tell and each of the archetype really stands for me really stands out and you can actually associate them with different with different people in your life and if you're familiar with the hero journey and and I do, I do talk about it sometimes it's that some of these characters like the wizard or um, the lady of the lake people like that do appear in our life and it's I just find this is a very wonderful and extraordinary legend or myth. And hopefully at some point I can talk about it a little bit more. Um, so why do I love myths so much? Because it really help us to learn about cause and effect. And it also talks a lot about illusions. For me, illusion, the magic, and all this, and what is really true and real. Um, and in all mythology or story, you will find a common thread that often love prevail, where you start with fear, you start with adversity, but often who wins or what comes at the end is love, when you actually can see through the illusion, when you can go past it, when you can overcome it, then what is really true at the end of the tunnel, it's, it's always love will win. Whether it's saving your princess, slating the dragon, and not, not necessarily romantic love. It could be saving a country, saving a, a family, or doing something right because you love your people, you know. So, but it is a very strong moral value. And to me, it's so important that if we don't, if we don't grow up with story like that and have a clear sense of, I guess, righteousness. Um, who are we, you know, uh, in a society where now we hear so many you know, things on the news and you wonder, how could people do such a thing? How could they treat one another with so little care? And I think sometimes this is brought back to, well, I think a lot in a lot of modern cultures where we're so busy with making a living, but what is real good living? It's you living with purpose, are you living with kindness? That kind of thing, do we talk about it enough? And maybe this myth show us a different story, tell us a different um, cause and effect, so maybe we will pay a bit more attention about how we treat others, you know. I will go back to one of those um, later when we talk about uh, beauty and the beast as well. So another thing about mythology is really interesting because they show you at that time where the story was written or that in that culture, what is the hierarchy of power? What is individual power, say masculine versus feminine and that society and that culture and the collective power um, and as well as divine power? You often will, will hear in that myth that how is the society structured? And within that different hierarchy of power, you will also hear um, the cause and effect as well as um, the morale in each of them. So another wonderful and really interesting about mythology is that you often find that the say that the spirit of God or the souls or universe or the creator, whomever you name it, often see the big picture. Um, as in you don't know that when you go down to this path or go into that forest or go and trying to um, uh, go in this adventure, what are you going to come out of it? You don't know. You you only know what is in front of you. You know only know where it come from. Uh, you only know your current circumstance, whether you were um, being forced to, called for, or invited to embark your hero journey. It's um, you only see what you see right now, and you don't see beyond the illusion of time, whether it's pre um, past the future. Well the divine powers see the whole picture. So in mythology you often see that contrast where we human are so um, so bounded by our current circumstance. We actually don't know what's around the corner. And I think that helps us to think about, you know, faith and hope and following your heart and, and that sort of I don't know, teachings. <laughs> um, so this is why I, I think mythology actually teaches really valuable lessons. So, okay, enough about why I love about mythologies and all that stuff. But um, I think that's just some of the reasons that I share, and, and I'm sure many people will have different, you know, comments or different idea about it. But um, that's the way I see it, where it applies to our current life. And Lao Tzu also said that, you know, um, you know yourself, know, thy, know thyself is very important. You know, knowing others is smart and wise, but knowing yourself is a true master. So I think getting to know yourself 
is not a simple thing. It takes time and maturity. And without enough reflection, contemplation, it's not going to be so easy. And by reading or looking at these mythology or stories and listen to these tales, sometimes invite us to look at our current circumstance. And I think that invites us to self-reflect as well. So now we're going to talk about, we, I think we have time, and we're going to talk about definitely two, two stories here. So um, some of us, some of, some of you have written to me, and I picked two. And at the moment, um, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to talk about Beauty and the Beast. So um, we we know this tale very well, and as in Disney pictures and so forth. So I think everybody kind of know the basis of the story about Beauty and the Beast, how Bella has to go into the castle in the place of her father to spend time with the Beast because the Beast, you know, gave father all the presents and then you know father promised and so forth. Um, but I mean, the story itself, in that sense, we all know about it, and it. Not as important, but I find what is really interesting is look at what the beast represent. So when you look at the beast, or what is the beast, you know, um, being described in the picture or in the book, it's about being ugly, about being scary. It's gigantic. It's a uh, hairy. It's like you know, it it represents fear, what we don't like, what we're afraid of, and. And then in the story, then of course we know that he's actually a prince underneath, you know, who just been cursed by a wicked witch. So and so, what does that mean? So the ugliness, the fears, uh, the the scary appearance, these are just illusion, covering that who he really is, a prince. So that already tell us something in the story that you know sometimes what we see is just an illusion. What is underneath it? It's something we yet to discover. Now at the end, when um, obviously Bella didn't come back to the castle as she promised, she she stayed longer at home, and the Beast was pretty upset and getting sick, la 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 la. So actually, and then when Bella went back to um, rescue the Beast, and when her tears reached the the Beast, then he transformed, yeah, becoming the prince because it's true love and so forth. So that's just the basic of the story, right? But what does it represent again? So. When Bella saw the bees in pain and suffering, sometimes through suffering, suffering, human suffering, it invites us to be kinder, invite us to open our heart, to become more compassionate. Sometimes it's about we are the one who is suffering, or when we witness someone who is suffering. When that happens, often we open the heart. And then so when Bella's tear touches the beast, he transforms. So what does it mean? He when he experienced love. He transformed, and when she see see him being hurt because of her not returning, she see how much um, she has caused him pain. She trans she changed. She recognized the truth. You know, this is this is interesting because underneath all the illusion, we know that he's actually a prince, a great guy, but we so often get carried away about what we see, and or what we believe we see. Um, and we're going to talk about the belief part in another tale, just in a minute. But and um, I find that it is a myth that again invite us to look deeper into ourselves and also others. Again, the opposite of love is not hate but fear. And uh, but underneath, all, but and it's only illusion. It's not real. Underneath it, it's true love. So if you can cut through it, if you can go bypass the illusion, when you invite yourself to open up and become more compassionate, use this opportunity. You will discover. You will allow yourself or um, supporting someone else to transform. And um, I think this is one of the sweetest tale because of that. And um, another thing. I like to talk about it's the fact that how he became a beast in the first place. So he was withholding love from the wicked witch. So okay, the back one story was um, apparently the witch was angry at him because it was a rainy night, but he didn't open the castle door to to um to help the witch. So she got angry and transformed it into a beast. So basically, that tell us that when he was withholding love, um, which is you know, not very kind to the wicked witch. She used, you know, she she created a spell on him and make him fearful. 
Um, and often, when this is a serious situ when it's a situation that is loveless, it's always opportunity to ask for for love. And um, and I would say, wounded people wound people. So when she felt rejected or not cared for, she decided to put a spell on him. So that goes on and on and on. If that's what we want to play in our life, when if someone does something to you and hurt you, and you decided to retaliate, they just go on and on and on, create a vicious circle. So when there's a lack of love, what does it call for? Love and compassion and forgiveness. And of course, the beast learned it at the end, I suppose. Um, but I think that's just another interesting to think about because we don't often look at the wicked witch and think about, oh, she was rejected and hurt in the first place. You know, he didn't try, he didn't open the door for her. But we don't look into it. We, we really focus on the belly and the beast bit. But I think it's important to think about it. I mean, the thing about forgiveness is that often people may find it Forgiveness sounds like, you know, no matter what you do to me, it's okay. I'm so spiritual now, so I'm going to forgive you, so to set myself free. You know, if I want to hear that, I find it's, you can hear it it's in a superficial level that, you know, okay, I forgive you because I'm so much more spiritual than you right now. It doesn't come from that place. Forgiveness, for me, first of all, is a process. And you really need to see through the, the reason why someone hurt you in the first place, as I said, when the people win people. So when you're willing to see the innocent in the other person or what you might have done wrong in the first place, your errors as well, it makes forgiveness in a diff help we see in a different light. And forgiveness doesn't mean that I can be your doormat either. Forgiveness really is about seeing beyond the illusions and willing to see the situation differently think about what responsibility I may take in this situation in the beast case then maybe he should just open a door um, and of course what can you do after so I think that's a lot more than it so like I mean I'm not going to spend more time on this now but you know what I'm getting at yeah a simple tell like that can actually talk about so many deeper subject and you know forgiveness is it's a talk in itself um, so, but that's why this is conversation that matter. I may start to talk about myths and mythology and fairy tales, but then you know you get hold of the bag or something else. So, <laughs> now, um, I want to ask you at this point, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that there may be some dreams or some symbols that really capture some mind. So, for you, what is it? so as I, I said before, for me, it was Little Mermaid, and um, and in my dreams, I when I used to, um, dream a lot, not so much now because I can't really lack of sleep with the little baby. <laughs> but I used to dream a lot about um, losing my teeth, um, running running away from people chasing me or running in a situation where I felt my feet couldn't move. Like I tried to run really fast but my foot just couldn't move. And uh, I always find these are two recurring themes for me. So some of you already know what they mean. So, but we're not going to talk about it right now. But think about some of the thin themes and symbols that really vivid to you. So that you know, some maybe towards the end of this that you may suddenly go, oh, maybe that means this. Sometimes what came to mind, it's um, it tends to be your intuition tends to, you know, help you to figure it out because as I said, your unconscious is always seeking our expression. So it's helping us to put in touch with our unconscious. So conscious mind may try to analyze and think about all that, but it's often that when you are listening to me, but that says suddenly your unconscious mind just feel a word, and you're like, ah, oh, so that means that. So anyway, the next tell or not tell fairy tale, yes, that I want to talk about is the Wizard of Oz, um, and other person that wrote on my Facebook page um, that she said she loved that story, um, and she even had Dorothy's shoes, the the shoes that you can cut together. So now, I think, I mean, well, I guess there's so many things you can talk about this fairy tale, but what really um, caught me in terms of what I think about it and decide to write some notes and prepare for today, what's about, you know, the fact that, you know, um, at the beginning we, we, we established that the scarecrow wants a brain, the tin woodman wants a heart, and the cowardly lion wants courage, and of course Dorothy wants to go home. So what really got me this time when I'm 
revisit the tale is that, you know, they all think something is missing in them. They all wanted something because they think by having it, they will be complete. By having it, they will be better. Um, and as the tale go on, I don't think they need that. You know, I think Scarecrow doesn't really need a brain or Woodman really is a heart because they actually have, you know, uh, you know, the intelligence and they're smart enough to, you know, overcome some of the challenges and, you know, they're kind enough to help each another, well, each other. So, and of course, the cow, the lions want to encourage, but then, yeah, he may be cowardly most of the times, but you can always choose again in new, different situation. And then he obviously, he stood up um, against the uh, winky soldiers. So I think what I find very profound in this, at this time when I'm reading it and think about it, what came to me was that so often we think something is missing in us and we are trying to get what we think we lack. Um, and thinking by having these things will be complete, will be whole and will be better. And you know, I'm not saying that if you're really sick or overweight or unhealthy or heavy smoker by wanting to become healthier, that's the wrong thing. I don't mean that by all means. I mean that it's when there's something outside of us that we think that we must achieve or get in order to complete ourselves, that I don't think necessarily is true. Uh, sometimes our perception telling us that we may not be good enough. Um, to me, that often is what our ego mind is telling us. The ego always speaks first and speaks loudest. So sometimes in a situation, we just act on our impulse, triggered by our ego. And then when we make a mistake, when we you know get messed up, then ego will say, you know, I told you, so you shouldn't have done it. You should have done it better. So we're never good enough in ego's perspective. And for me, the ego represents a perception of ourself that it's a little me um, and not the big I where we are part of um, divine creation, um, we're all spirit, having a human experience. Um, that's my own view, and I don't very much come from a particular religious background, so and I'm interested, I, I read different things in different religion, and I see, I take what I think uh, makes sense to me, what resonates with me. So going back to the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so again, another adventure, again, another hero or hero journey, what it really is when you know when I talk about hero journey is that you know at Star Wars and Hobbit, Love the Rings, all these are hero's journeys, written as written soul. Um, on the outside, it's a destination to get to, a task to fulfill, to find the ring, to destroy the ring, you know, um, to help Dorothy to go home. There's always an outer destination. It could be finding a place or getting the potion, killing the dragon or whatever. There's also like a destination, a final goal, um, external one. But what happened is that really what is really important is the internal transformation that will help you to get to the outer transformation, which is you know arriving at your goal or destiny. And without that maturity, without that transformation, without becoming who is supposed to be, then you won't get there. So same with, like, I love the Lord of the Rings example. Fredo cannot complete his task if he didn't go through all these, you know, challenges and um, receiving aid, uh, being in the belly of the whale and experience all that. Um, if he didn't have that inner transformation to become who he is at the end, he, he won't have the strength to to go back to the you know go to the, the what was it to the volcano or whatever that is and and to complete his task so the inner transformation is actually more important than the outer so um and that's what hero journey is really about and i sometimes would say hero and journey because i love to talk about the female lead um characters so now as I said before, the cowardly lion really stands to repel the winkle soldiers, winky soldiers. He didn't really need to find courage. I mean, yes, but he actually stepped up. It's already in him. It's about discovering or about, you know, stepping up and demonstrating it. So, and that's so often is that we seek external validation, but we already have it within us. But it's up to you to step it up and to reveal it, to express it or not. It's not that you don't have it, but it's how are you using it? Are you living it? So, and I think that's what really got me this time when I was looking at The Wizard of Oz. And, um, and I think a lot of these things that 
when you really think deeper, then you realize, ah, oh, there's some occasions that I actually stood up for myself, that like the cowed lions, and and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I make mistakes, and and everybody, nobody here is enlightened master. Sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't. And the beauty of this is that you can always choose again. So maybe today you you make a mistake, you didn't speak up for yourself, or you were less than kind to someone. But tomorrow you can do it again. You can find an opportunity to um, to choose again. So it's about learning that story, understanding what it is in you that you want to become. Um, and I think. That's come back to what I want to say at the beginning, where there are two kinds of people in this world. One kind is that they say, "I see it and I'll believe it." So show me the evidence, show me what is really true, and then I'll believe it. I'll buy into it. Otherwise, no, I'm going to just stay where I am. And the other kind is that they will say, "You believe, then you will see." I love the saying that Winda used to say that when you change the thing you um, when when you change the thing you see changes as well. So it's the same thing. Sometimes you have to believe, then you will see it. Let's say the cowardly lion. If the, he didn't believe that he could do this and he didn't step up, then of course the cause and effect is very obvious. And in effect, he wouldn't have stepped up and you know defeated the wicked soldiers. So I think. That's something that it's not easy to overcome sometimes. As and I said again, some days that we do it, we do it right, and sometimes we don't. But、um, another thing is that sometimes we may not have the faith and the strength in us that to tell us yes, you can do this, or yes,、um, you can change, and all that. And that's when I think having a strong spiritual practice is important. When I say spiritual practice, I don't mean you have to go to a certain kind of church or religious practice. What I mean is that really honor your inner self, honor your soul. It could be spending time to read inspirational books or meditation or things that help you to keep clear and grounded. You know who you are,、um, what you want to do in this lifetime, and how to live your life with kindness and compassion instead of just chasing around other external illusions. So. Having a practice like that will help you to have stronger faith, and for me, that's leaning on that faith. And sometimes there are days that you know you just feel everything is so blue and negative, and that's a time when you need your spiritual practice more. And sometimes it's about really carving out the time to do to to meditate and to pray. And sometimes it's maybe spending some time talking to someone that you know you can lean on their faith, where they will tell you, "No, I know that you can do this. I I know that you're going to come up on this tunnel." Let's say you know someone may suffer from depression. There are days that it's really really hard for them, and there may be days that they don't have the the strength to help themselves to see differently. And and it's 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 true. Not we can't necessarily manage every day. You know, and then there's the times that you will lean on someone else to help you to see it differently. So that's what I mean by leaning on someone's faith. That faith, maybe it's just simply they know you can do this, you can be better, you can become who you want to become, and so the current adversity will not last forever. And everything we see around us, as you know, many religious or spiritual books talk about, you know, is all illusion. So,、um, and the. Well, that's two things we need to talk about. So, okay, I'm not saying that you know everything is illusion in this physical world, so we don't have to you know pay our bills or put food on the table. I don't mean that. What I mean by illusion is that the fact that sometimes we think I can't deal with this,、um, you know, I'm I'm gonna fail, and this is not gonna work, and all this fear and worry. Sometimes they're just not true, and every given moment you can change. You can. You can choose again, and miracles can happen. You, you know, like the normal message says that you only see the little spot yourself. You don't necessarily see the bigger picture, like the the person who wrote the message does, or the divine power. We see the big picture, but we don't. We just, you know, have a little angle about. You know, I only see this forest. That's illusion.、Um, and I'm a little bit lost what I'm saying, actually. <laughs> but as I said before. Sometimes we just need to lean on one another when we, in terms of faith. So now I do digress quite often, isn't it? Isn't it? Like we talk about wizard balls. So 
believe it, then see it. So um, when Dorothy finally, you know, uh, finally met the Good Witch of the South, and she said, you know, you don't have to worry about it. You just, you know, click your shoes three times, and you can go back to Kansas City. Kansas City, you can go back home. And she was like, why didn't you tell me earlier about this? And the witch said, um, if I told you earlier, you wouldn't have believed me. And that's what sparked me to say at the beginning that, you know, um, see it and you believe it, or do you believe it, then you see it. So she had gone through her transformational journey, so obviously with the ventures she had, and she with a different way of looking at things. So, um, and then at that time, she clicked, and then of course she transformed. And this is not just mirac um, magical thinking, it's actually miraculous thinking, where you know that, you know, sometimes you need to believe something before you can see its manifestation. So, um, Another example, I think, is that if you believe um, people around you or the place you live, the place you work is full of people who are unkind, who are mean, who are cruel, if that's what you believe, your, your inner mind, your unconscious will often look for evidence to support it. So then you will definitely find evidence to suggest that people are cruel and the place you are um, are, are, are not very nice. But if you hold on the belief that, you know, there are good people around me, there are, things are better than what I used to know, and and things can change, and I'm changing myself. So when you look for love, when you believe in love, you will see evidence to suggest that too. So it's really about what do you choose. Do you choose to, to see the cup half empty and or half full? And by all means, I'm not saying that uh, you need to deny. Um, you need to... You know the fact that you know there are things that are unpleasant in in life or workplace or things that are around you, but I'm saying that the positive now is that you know this, but you know it's also part of the illusion where things can change, um, and you don't have to only focus on that. There are other things to to see and look forward to as well, and I think that makes a huge difference um, where you subscribe, where you put your energy into. And so at the end of the day is that what type of people are you, who you want to be, the type that you will say, I'll see and I believe it, or the other way around, you believe it, and that you will see it too. So I think that's one of the most important message I want to relate today. Um, I know this is a slightly different topic. Uh, we talk about myth, we talk about fairy tales, we talk about a few different things. Um, so... I hope that you enjoyed today's talk. And if some of you, as I said before, um, some of the dream symbols, some of the fairy tales and myths that you know came to mind when I start talking about the deeper meaning of these things, then if you got a tale that you want to share with me and you ask, want to ask me what do they really mean, why it bothers you, or why it makes you feel so good, then you know feel free to comment or to um, uh, private message me, and I will try my best to share with you what I find. And uh, as I said before, I introduced that we got Athena here today. She's one of um, the great goddess that I often uh, talk about in my talks and seminars. And her legend is obviously quite different. Her myth talks about uh, how wise women can survive in a man's world. And, you know, advantage would be she can, you know, she can succeed very well at, at, um, at school or at work and even military because she had, she's a strategist. But the, the problem with Athena sometimes is that her shadow aspect is that she's so headstrong, so she disconnect from her head to her heart, which is her emotions. So, you know, every archetype or every myth, you can, you can hear there's always a light side and then a shadow side. So, um, just like all of us. Um, anyway, so she's one of my favorite goddess, and I, I love to talk about different archetypes and myths. But... Um, I didn't expect I'm going to bring on to the conversation that matters series so soon, but we started and see how you guys react if this is something you'd like to hear more about, about the moral values or the, what you really can learn from myths and tales, then I, I would definitely share more with you. So, well, I hope you enjoyed today's talk and um, if you anything want to share with me, just um, comment below. So, have a good evening and I will see you all again next Wednesday. So, bye now.